I'm Nick Stewart. I've uh, been looking at uh, aquatic plants for uh, uh, over 40 years, uh, and now a uh, freelance con consultant ecologist. Um, uh, I think I got into uh, aquatic plants uh, initially, I think, because uh, no one else seemed to be looking at them. Uh, and as a group, they do tend to be still rather shunned by a, a lot of botanists. Um, some, uh, sometimes be because they feel they're too complicated, sometimes because um, they're, they're different genera from the terrestrial plants. Um, um, so I, I, over the years, I've been doing an, a, a, quite a few workshops uh, and uh, uh, for things like Field Studies Council and uh, BSBI and uh, not a number of the conservation agencies. I'm also uh, probably a lot of you, maybe some of you, be familiar that I, I'm uh, particularly keen on uh, on carophyte stoneworts, um, uh, and I'm the BSBI referee for that for that group. But uh, this morning I want to tackle uh, a group that uh, has some difficulties. There are easy bits and there are difficult bits, but they have a reputation for being universally difficult, but that's not entirely fair. Um, uh, so uh, uh, water crowfoots, uh, just to introduce uh, what, what they look like, uh, they're uh, a mem members of the genus Ranunculus, so, so they're, they're buttercups, but unlike the terrestrial buttercups, they have uh, white petals or, or white for most of the petals and, and yellow at, at the base. Um, and they produce a combination of leaves, the ones that float on the surface, which are, are laminar leaves expanded, um, uh, and there are those uh, uh, under, underwater leaves, which are capillary and <clears throat> sort of uh, uh, divided like uh, uh, into sort of feathery segments. Um, you notice that an uh, um, important character for separating from other feathery leaf things, uh, are that the, le the leaves are alternate, so they're staggered uh, up and down the stem. Uh, and this, th this is a whole leaf. Uh, uh, and you'll see that they divided um, uh, initially into three. Uh, the, f the first one or two divisions are, are three, and then later on they divided in two. But they're, they're dichotomous um, splits, so, it, uh, so that the uh, uh, segments are equal at, at each division, uh, rather than having a main line, uh, a main one with side branches. Um, <clears throat> And that combination of alternate leaves and forked uh, uh, divisions is, is a useful, important point for them separating from other things. And just to run through one or two of the other things that you might confuse, it, confuse them with, um, the floating leaves, <coughs> uh, one of the main uh, things to think about uh, is the uh, rather aggressive uh, introduction floating pennywort. Um, has uh, a leaf shape which is not dissimilar from uh, from water crowfoots, um, but uh, the <coughs> uh, more lobes uh, and uh, only a very narrow gap between between the uh, the, the basal lobes. Uh, but usually, the most obvious thing is that it's hugely vigorous, and you'll have great masses of it uh, uh, either floating on the water or even coming out uh, uh, of the water. <clears throat> um, among the feathery things, there are a number of things that you could confuse them with. Um, and the, the things to look for are whether the leaves are whirled. So you, in the, um, you've got uh, hornworts here, uh, which have forked leaves uh, like, like the water crowfoots. Uh, but you see that the leaves are all co coming out in a whirl rather than singly. Milfoils also, but the, the divisions of the leaves are quite different, uh, uh, pinnate divisions. Um, and bladderworts uh, also have a sort of a, a complex, um, but essentially there is usually a main line running through. Uh, and of course, the, 
usually little bladders amongst the leaves, which are distinctive of, of, of the bladder words. Um, there are also um, two uh, um, carrot family species, uh, <coughs> which again have feathery under, underwater leaves. Um, and these are all alternate, like, like the water crowfoots. Um, but instead of being uh, tuning fork divisions, uh, dichotomous divisions, uh, the, the first, at least the first division is a pinnate division, i.e. Uh, a main stem as it, uh, get running through and then side branches rather than a completely forked. Uh, AP inundation marsh wet is, is, has quite a narrow leaf uh, uh, and uh, uh, Onat the aquatica, uh, this is all one leaf I should say, but uh, uh, so you've got one pinnate and you've got another pinnate division there and probably another pinnate division there. Um, so there uh, uh, are, I think, eight species uh, recognised uh, in Ireland and Britain. Um, they uh, uh, sort of divide into two groups that uh, I'll sort of go into more detail in a minute, but the, uh, these are essentially rather shallow uh, pool or muddy things that don't have these capillary leaves or very rarely in the case of tripartitus. Um, and uh, a much bigger group with uh, both capillary leaves uh, and laminar leaves uh, uh, may or may not be present. Um, there is uh, and has been over the years quite a, a lot of flux in, in the names that have been used, uh, particularly in this area, uh, in the sort of peltatus and penicillatus area. Uh, and uh, at times, uh, the, the, they're being treated as subspecies, sometimes as species, sometimes as, uh, as varieties. Um, and these are, these are the ones that we've sort of uh, centered on at the moment. But one of the problems with uh, particularly the, that group of uh, the Penicillatus peltatus uh, group is that there is uh, quite a lot of uh, introgression and, and, and hybridization and, uh, and uh, essentially they're still evolving as species um, and, and the divisions between them are sometimes rather uh, clear, uh, not very clear cut um, and that's probably the, one of the, the main difficulties in, in, in the group. Uh, some of these other ones are very easy to do um, but, but this is the more difficult area. And I won't go into a lot, a lot of dis discussion today about hybrids, but you do need to be aware that, uh, particularly in rivers, you can have quite extensive hybrid populations, um, uh, sometimes more common than the actual uh, species involved. And, and they're, because a lot of uh, uh, the sort of spread is vegetative, they can persist. Uh, they're not sort of uh, fly by night hybrids, they, they persist for quite, uh, for probably centuries. So, um, for, uh, in terms of resources, the uh, most uh, 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 important resource for water crowfoots, the go-to book, is Plant Group, uh, which has an extensive section uh, uh, on water crowfoots uh, written by Sarah Webster. Um, uh, and uh, uh, if you don't actually have the book, you can uh, go to the website, uh, the BSBI website, uh, where, where you can download uh, bits, of the, bits of this book. Um, it's generally quite a good book for aquatic plants anyway, so it's not just uh, for water crowfoots. Uh, you will find in, uh, in this uh, quite a complex and maybe even a little scary key um, and it's basically uh, a tables of characters um, and uh, uh, against the, the species. Um, and uh, so, for example, here, this is laminar leaves present, uh, and these are the ones that have the laminar leaves, uh, and uh, the white squares are never present. Uh, so, 
Uh, and basically what you do is you, you work through the characters and see which fits best. Uh, um, and uh, there's, there's a second part of the table, which I'll come to now, uh, which uh, take, uh, these are more, uh, this, this part of the table is more dealing with the flower characters, whereas the, the, the first table was dealing more with, uh, with the leaf characters. And in fact, the suggestion is, I think, to, that you get a piece of paper and you score which, which characters uh, you can see and see which, and sort of move it down and see which, which species it fits best with. Uh, but uh, in, in the plant crib, there's also quite an extensive discussion about the characters and, and, and what you're looking for. Uh, Another uh, useful book for water crowfoots is this book by uh, Richard Lansdowne uh, on riverine plants. Uh, it it uh, also goes into quite a lot of detail of the water crowfoots and is, is also a useful book to use. Um, uh, this is a key that I, I, I produced, this store sort of, uh, table really uh, that I produced uh, and this is uh, one of various aquatic keys which are uh, available on the uh, Aquatic Plants Project website. Um, it, uh, it, it, my approach to the water crowfoots uh, is essentially that there are a number of species that are quite easy to distinguish um, uh, and uh, the best thing is to pick those off and say, okay, uh, 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 for example, here, uh, I'll come to the more detail, but this one doesn't have hairs on the fruits uh, and, and that's quite a distinctive character. You can sort of quite quickly rule that out um, uh, or um, not necessarily rule it out, it might, might be correct, um, but you can sort of pick off uh, these species around the edge uh, fairly easily. Um, and then you're left very often with this core in the middle where things are a little bit more complicated. Um, and essentially the, the table is divided up into species that you only have floating leaves. Uh, those that have a mixture of floating leaves and, uh, 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 and capillary leaves. Uh, and these are ones at the bottom which have uh, 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 never, never have any floating leaves. Uh, you'll notice that a number of them uh, sort of come, uh, just edge over the line. Uh, for example, up here, like this tripartitus. Uh, can you actually see that on the screen? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, th this one's run up this tripartitus, which does occasionally produce uh, capillary leaves, but most of the time just has floating leaves. Um, uh, these ones here, uh, again, you see them crossing over the line. Um, the, the cautionary thing here is that, particularly at the beginning of the season, often uh, plants will get to the surface and flower before they pre produce uh, floating leaves. So there is a, sometimes a period uh, when you can find uh, plants that don't have floating leaves, uh, but if you if you came back a month later, you would find that they do have floating leaves. Um, uh, and uh, if you if you read the uh, the plant crib account, it does even say that some populations never actually get to produce floating leaves, which is a complication because how do you then start separating it from some of the other ones? But uh, uh, that that that's a that's a problem that I'll come to later. Um, the other division on, on this table is uh, on the left to right side, uh, is that uh, on the left, you have species that have uh, rather short leaves, the, the shorter than the internodes, you've got bare stem uh, between each, each, sort of, uh, each leaf. Uh, uh, and these ones on the right, which have much longer leaves. Uh, and essentially this is a division between the ones on the right are uh, exclusively river species uh, and the ones on the left are, are much more associated with standing waters but they do occur in rivers as well particularly in sort of quieter areas but or, or sometimes uh, at 
the uh, um, higher up the system, um, uh, you will tend to get more pond, of, of these essentially pond species on the left uh, and the river species on the right. So if we look at some of these characters and uh, some of these things in a bit more detail. Um, so essentially what we're discussing there uh, are the ones with the short leaves here, uh, like the ones with the and you can see that they're quite sort of bushy, the leaves. Uh, uh, that's another common feature of these. And you can see that the stem, there's quite a bit of bare stem between, between the leaves. Uh, on, the, on the left here, we've got Ranchus fluotans, which is one of the river group. Um, and you can see the leaves are much longer. They tend to be uh, more parallel sided. Uh, sorry, not parallel sided, uh, tend to sort of the, the, the segments are uh, much more parallel. Uh, and, uh, and there's much uh, more overlap between leaves. And I'm not sure you can actually see where, where stems start and, uh, and the leaves are. Um, I should perhaps say that sometimes uh, it's not always as clear cut, uh, particularly if I, if I go back up to this table, uh, you'll see that pseudofluotans is crossing the lines. And very often you'll find uh, on, on pseudofluotans that there are some uh, internodes that are longer than the leaves and there are some that are shorter. Uh, and that's quite a common feature of, of pseudofluotans. And, and you can, um, uh, uh, sort of be left scratching your head, what, which, which way am I going to go on that? Um, the group that ha only have floating leaves, or as I say, in the case of uh, Ranuxus tripartis, rather rarely produce uh, uh, capillary leaves, um, they are quite easy to do, and they can be done uh, flowering uh, or uh, just on, based on the leaves. Uh, if they're flowering, uh, Omeophilus, the, uh, the moorland water crowfoot, uh, has larger flowers. They're about sort of four to six millimeters, those petals, uh, whereas both Tripartitus and Hederasis uh, have smaller, they're sort of two to four millimeter petals. Um, but they're easy enough to do on the leaves. Um, uh, and uh, what you look at is the extent of lobing, um, and and the way to do that is to uh, uh, to look at uh, the width of the the lobe uh, where they join together. And you see in hederaceous, the uh, the widest point of the lobe uh, is actually where it joins onto the next next lobe of the leaf. Whereas in Emeophilus, the widest point is that part that area here, and then it actually narrows again uh, it, um, to the point where the, it joins onto the next lobe. Uh, so there's, a, there's sort of these sort of incisions uh, in, in between the lobes. Um, and Ranunculus tripartitus, which is a, is a very rare species that occurs uh, across the southern England and uh, southwest Wales, and I think there's a locality in, in southwest Ireland. Um, uh, in southwest Cork. Um, uh, and here there's a much bigger gap between the leaf lobes. So those, those are, are, are quite easy to do uh, and you don't have to worry about the flowering, which is of course an issue with uh, uh, some of the ones that we're going to come to. Um, the only uh, warning I would say is that the celery leaf buttercup, which isn't the crowfoot, has yellow flowers <coughs> and grows up. Uh, it's much more of an emergent species growing up out of the water. When it, uh, when it first comes to the water surface, you will have this floating leaf, which looks very ranunculus-like. <coughs> um, and it won't have any capillary leaves with it. Um, uh, and you, it, it can be, leave you scratching your head as to what it is, but it's actually, um, uh, this, this is what it looks like on land. And uh, you can see that it's growing up out, well, not very clear, but you can see it growing up out of the water. Um, but it's a more, much more complex leaf than 
the, the ones we were looking at before, uh, which are, are, are much more simply lobed. Um, there is one other species that is easy to do and you don't have to have flowers. And that is the fan leaf water crowfoot, Ranthus cercinatus. And the distinctive thing about this is that the leaf segments are all held in one plane. So if you look sort of side on to, to, to the leaf, uh, it, it just looks like a sort of uh, a, a flat surface. Um, uh, and it's the only one that does that. Um, uh, and it also tends to have quite a large gap between the leaves. Um, uh, and actually, the, the only slight confusion to worry about is that if, if uh, you could mistake it for hornwort. Um, but notice that the leaves of the hornwort uh, that sort of come out all, all the way around. Whereas uh, th this leaf, although it's sort of almost enclosing the stem, actually it all uh, starts from, from this point here. And you can see it divides and then divides and, uh, and divides. Um, and uh, so it, this is a st uh, going back to it has staggered leaves and alternate leaves, whereas these are leaves and whorls. <coughs> um, they do both have little spiny teeth on the tips, so that, uh, but uh, uh, ceratophyllums tend to also to have spiny teeth on, on the sides of the leaves. Now, I'm going to simplify things a little bit. Uh, there are, uh, for, for all of the rest of the species, um, uh, there are two simple rules that, uh, first of all, if they're terrestrialized plants, then don't touch them. Ranunculus spur. Uh, the terrestrialized forms of plant, uh, of water crowfoots, look very different from the aquatic forms. Very often, species that would normally produce floating leaves don't when they're terrestrial. Um, uh, and the, the leaves uh, are always very much shorter than they would be in water. Uh, for example, uh, the, these were plants that were about sort of uh, uh, 50 centimeters apart. Uh, uh, this was growing in the water and you can see that it has sort of very extensive, uh, quite long leaves. Whereas this is all a mat of terrestrialized material, much finer, very short leaved. Um, and so the uh, rule number one, if it's terrestrialized, ranunculus spur, don't even try. Uh, rule number two, if they're not flowering, also just record them as ranunculus spur. Um, the, the reason for that is, is uh, not necessarily that you need the flowers to identify them, but if they are flowering, it tells you that they're in an advanced state, uh, a mature enough state, that, for example, you're very likely to find floating leaves if it produces floating leaves. Um, and some of the other characters uh, uh, that, that are used for identification should be there. Whereas if they're not flowering, then you don't know those, whether they would be there if, if the plants were more mature. So again, if they're not flowering, the, the rule is just record them as ranunculus spur. Um, uh, and actually, just a, a quick diversion there in terms of recording, uh, just there are a number of ways that aquatic, sort of unidentified aquatic ranunculuses uh, are recorded. And you'll find in the uh, uh, BSBI mapping scheme a number of variations of, uh, uh, and to just sort of differentiate between them. Ranunculus spur accurately covers all the terrestrial species too. But very often the terrestrial species uh, are easy to identify and don't need to be recorded as just spur. But uh, it is, it has that ambiguity that it could be um, ranunculus repens or, some, or, or uh, still be included in ranunculus spur. 
uh, Ranculus sect, uh, section Batrachian covers all of the watercrafts, all the ones that we're discussing uh, this morning. Um, uh, uh, but it includes things like uh, uh, Heteraceous and Homeophilus, which are quite easy to identify. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a broader term than maybe, uh, I mean, it's usually these non-flowering or terrestrialized um, uh, uh, ones which, which in, the, in the more difficult part of the, of the group that you're wanting to cover. And possibly the best term for that is Ranunculus aquatilis ag or uh, Ranunculus aquatilis sen sensulatu. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's the one that normally refers to the species that are difficult to identify. But I think, I think if you look up the, the mapping scheme, I, th I think the only species covered are uh, Trichophilus aquatilis peltatus uh, and penicillatus. And doesn't include things like uh, Baudotii and Fluotans, which might also cause problems. Um, so uh, there, is, there is an ambiguity and I'm not entirely sure what the best, the best way to record them is. Um, so if we work around the species that have distinctive characters um, that are quite easy to, to pull out from, from the group. Um, well, I've, I've, I previously talked about Ranunculus circinatus, that's an, a nice easy one to, to pick out. Ranunculus trichophilus is also quite easy because the flowers are much smaller than, than all the others. The petals are only up to four, uh, six millimeters long and, and there is a gap between the, the, there's usually a gap between the petals rather than the usual sort of complete saucer that, that most of the water crowfoots have. The, it, 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 the, the petals look more fingery. Um, and that's usually enough to, to pick out that uh, uh, as a species. Um, Ranculus boidosii is a uh, brackish water species. Um, uh, and produces, uh, it's one of, the, one of the ones that produces floating leaves. Uh, the distinctive characters are, are, uh, are uh, the most useful character uh, is that uh, whereas in most species, uh, if you look at the fruits, uh, you'll find little bristles uh, uh, sticking out. Uh, particularly if you look, hold them up and, and look in profile, you can often see these uh, little hairs sticking out from the fruits. Uh, by Adelti, the, the fruits uh, are hairless, uh, glabrous. Uh, they also tend to be more, uh, more fruits in a head, often there's uh, up to sort of 50 in, in a head of Baudotii. Um, uh, and that's, th that's the character that's probably easiest to use, but there are one or two other characters. Uh, if you took, uh, if, if I go back up to uh, this one, uh, if you took all the seeds off, off here, you'll be left with a, a core in the middle, which is called the receptacle. Uh, and the receptacle in, uh, uh, in Baudotii is quite elongate, particularly when it's, uh, when it's mature. Whereas in most species, the receptacle would be quite sort of uh, round and, and sort of much shorter than this. But it's quite sort of uh, uh, a pointed uh, receptacle. Um, another useful character is uh, the, this uh, is that it uh, Baudotii has uh, produces wings on the fruit, particularly when they're dry. You, uh, it, it, it's much clearer if you dry the fruits. Um, you'll notice here that there are some bristles on the fruit, which is why this this is probably actually a hybrid rather than. Uh, um, uh, rather than Baudotii on its own, but it, it's uh, the best picture I had, or, or, or that Claudia had, um, to, to show this, this wing. Um, now, you will see in all sorts of texts talk about Baudotii having blue tip sepals. This is a character that's been sitting around and it really needs to be binned. Um, uh, most 
ranunculuses produce either sort of purplish or bluish tips to their sepals. Uh, it's not, as far as I can see, anything distinctive about Baudossia, but you'll find it going back in the literature for, for decades. Um, so um, forget about that one. Uh, one of the other distinctive ones that uh, have characters that, that can help separate uh, from, from the main uh, group uh, is Ranunculus fluitans. Ranunculus fluitans is one of the long-leaved river ones. Uh, it never produces floating leaves. Um, uh, but you can uh, separate this one off by the number of times the, the leaf divides. So... <clears throat> Uh, if you, uh, that looks like the base of the leaf there. So you, if you worked your way out, you've got one division there, second division there, third division there, and uh, another rather fine division at the end there. Um, if, if you looked at Peltatus or Penicillatus, you would find that, uh, and counted the number of times that they divide, you would find that it would be up, up in the uh, five, six times uh, whereas in Runcus fluotans, they only ever divide four times. Um, another character, which is one that I've never really tested, um, but uh, apparently um, Runcus fluotans only very rarely produces uh, roots uh, at the nose along the stem. Um, what you'll find is that uh, the, the river. Uh, crowfoots tend to, uh, uh, when the when water levels are, are low, uh, they will uh, um, <clears throat> they, they will uh, put a lot of effort into flowering, and you'll get these nice fine uh, displays of white flowers uh, across the river. If it then starts uh, um, uh, uh, raining again and the water levels start going up. Um, you'll find uh, that uh, uh, very often they will uh, shed the flowers and any floating leaves that they have, uh, and they will put their effort into vegetative growth. And uh, in that process, they will produce roots from the nodes, and those roots will sort of uh, bind into the soil uh, and it will spread uh, vegetatively. Uh, and that's quite an important part of, of, of how uh, beds build up as, a, as they grow over the summer. Um, but uh, in Penicillatus, you will very often find these, uh, these you can see here, sort of roots coming from the nodes. Uh, and apparently, and I can't say this from first-hand experience, in Ranctus fluotans, that's uh, much, much rarer. Uh, you can see again that the number of divisions in, uh, in Penicillatus is uh, you've got quite quite a, a lot of divisions, whereas here again, the, there are much fewer. So you've got one division, two divisions, three divisions, four divisions. Um, there's also a receptacle character. Uh, uh, if you're talking about by Dossier a little while ago, you can see that it uh, has an elongated receptacle whereas the, this is the more common uh, shape of the receptacle. Uh, and uh, the, the receptacles in most species are, are quite hairy, uh, but in fluid hands, there are, uh, there are only a few hairs. Uh, and that can be another character that, that, uh, that helps separate. Um, yeah, there's a, that one, this one's probably uh, a Ranunculus penicillatus, I think. Um, uh, and you can see, so the, this is, this is the, the fruits have been pulled off and you're left with this core in the middle, which is the receptacle uh, uh, and uh, with, with all its hairs on. So if we go back to the table, we've, we've, we've talked about the uh, ones that only produce floating leaves. Um, and we've talked about these satellite ones, which have the distinctive characters, so Phaidotiae, doesn't have hairs on the fruits. Uh, Trichophilus has very small petals. Uh, Cercinatus has the leaves all in one plane. And uh, Fluotans, the leaves uh, uh, 
less fr frequently divided and has the sparsely hairy receptacle. And you're left with a core of uh, species in, in the middle. And these are more difficult. Um, uh, and very often you're having to make a judgment, the best judgment on uh, best fit, rather than having hard and fast characters and saying, um, it, it, it's got this character, therefore it's this. You ha have to look at a combination of characters uh, and see which be fits best. Um, and <clears throat> the, the, uh, the various characters to sort of bear in mind and whether, whether or not there are lamina leaves produced. Um, petal size, you'll see that the quatulus is quite a lot smaller than a peltatus and penicillatus. Um, Nectar pit I will come to in a minute. Um, the, these ones are essentially um, pond species, so the, the leaves, the capillary leaves are shorter than the internodes, whereas in penicillatus they're longer, uh, and in the pseudofluotans and vertumnus they can be a mixture. Um, uh, and uh, the length of the leaf, it, it tends to be associated with that, so these are generally longer leaf ones. Um, and uh, the rigidity, these are the ones, these ones uh, tend to be uh, more sort of three-dimensional, bushy, uh, as opposed to more or less parallel sided. Uh, and if you have intermediate leaves, uh, there are differences there, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, uh, and, though, uh, and the thing is to look at uh, all of these characters and, and make a judgment as to which fits best. Um, now, nectar pits, um, there are, uh, these are a little sort of, if you look at the base and the yellow part of the, uh, of the petals, uh, you'll find in all the species, there's a little raised structure. Um, and in some of them, they are sort of more or less circular. Uh, uh, and in others, uh, particularly the river ones and peltatus, uh, they are much lo longer and, uh, and uh, sometimes described as pear-shaped, but or just elongate rather than a circle. Now you do have to be very careful on this uh, because the, you will find variations uh, in, uh, in one flower uh, between the shapes of, of the nectar pits. Um, and uh, sometimes I think uh, the more mature leaves, uh, uh, petals, the, the uh, nectar pits can, can look different. Um, and you'll find, I mean, in Britain, there's been a sort of tradition to separate circular for ones that are just half moon shaped. Um, but I find that quite difficult to do because even in circular ones, it begins to fade up at the top. Uh, you can see that that does seem to be a complete circle. Uh, but the, uh, the bottom is always much more pronounced and, and it, they tend to fade. And, it, uh, and for me, the only useful thing is to decide whether it's circular or elongate. But there are other, there are other descriptions where uh, uh, I think there are um, some uh, seven or eight different shapes that are described in some texts, particularly uh, in continental Europe. Um, but uh, I have to have to say that uh, people like Richard Lansdowne uh, 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 would probably say don't use nectar pits at all uh, because he, he finds them completely unreliable. I think they can help in the decision, but you just have to bear in mind uh, that certainly you wouldn't rely exclusively on the shape of the nectar pit, but it's an extra character to look at uh, when, when you're making a judgment. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, one of the characters that you can use is if you have a, a fruiting um, uh, peduncle, uh, uh, opposite a, a lamina leaf, and you compare the length of the of the peduncle with the uh, uh, length of the petiole. In a quatulus, uh, this should the the leaf petiole should be longer than the the, the fruiting peduncle, um, whereas in peltatus and in penicillatus variations, uh, they should be 
uh, <coughs> the, the, the fruiting pedestal should be longer. Um, intermediate leaves don't uh, see those all that often, but if you do, they are an extra useful character. Um, the peltatus and penicillatus, um, you'll see that the uh, the intermediate leaves, you've got part, part of it uh, a lamina and part of it's capillary. Uh, and in, in uh, peltatus and penicillatus, the capillary part is the, the bit furthest towards the tips. Uh, whereas in aquatilis, uh, it's the other way around. You have the divisions um, uh, uh, near the uh, base of the leaf, and then the lamina parts will be uh, it become la uh, sort of completely lamina towards the tip of the leaf. Um, but uh, one thing I have read somewhere, I can't vouch for it myself, uh, is that if you do have a lot of intermediate leaves, it can be an indication that it's a hybrid. Um, uh, I, I can't verify that, but I've seen that uh, written in a number of places. Um, there are a number of characters that, that you'll come across in books, um, which I think are dubious or even completely useless. Uh, I've touched on blue tip sepals uh, earlier. Um, uh, I, I, it's a character that I've never been able to understand. I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, all species can produce purplish, bluish uh, tips to the sepals. Uh, in some cases you'll see that there are uh, mentions to the number of bristles on the tip. Uh, if there is a difference, it's very difficult because they get brushed off very quickly. Um, uh, and I certainly wouldn't want to rely. I mean, how do you know if that's how many that bristles that had originally when most of them are, 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 have been brushed off? Um, uh, in the plant crib, there's descriptions of the stipules, um, and I think there are differences. The stip so this is the leaf stalk coming in here, and where it joins the stem, the, there are these uh, um, uh, little flaps, uh, which are stipules, um, and there's supposed to be differences in the shape uh, and how much they are attached to the, to the petioles. This has quite a sort of gap between the top of the, the uh, stipule and the petiole, but there are other ones where it would go straight across uh, and connect for longer with, with the petiole base. Um, uh, it's, they're discussed at quite some length in the plant crib. Uh, in practice, though, they're pretty, all, pretty usually always torn and shredded and battered, uh, and actually getting a clear view of what the stipules would look like uh, is usually pretty difficult, uh, and it's a character that uh, don't tend to use at all, um, just because it, it's difficult to find material that, that has the characters that you're supposed to be looking at. <clears throat> uh, so just uh, to uh, run through the, the, the species in this, this group, um, penicillatus, um, uh, var, uh, subspecies Penicillatus uh, is one of the easiest ones because it has river, uh, it's a river type with long leaves um, uh, exceeding the internodes, and it also has floating leaves. So that combination will take you uh, to Penicillatus, uh, subspecies Penicillatus. Uh, in Ireland, uh, this is the common subspecies. Uh, so it makes it quite a lot easier in Ireland uh, um, uh, because uh, uh, very often, if you look hard enough, sometimes you have to look quite hard for the floating leaves, but, but usually there are one or two around uh, and you can say that it's penicillatus, penicillatus. Uh, penicillatus pseudofluorotans doesn't have those floating leaves. This is subspecies pseudofluorotans. Um, and uh, that can be a bit more difficult um, to separate, say, from fluorotans. You'll have to sort of look at the numbers of segments to separate it from fluorotans. And also 
um, there are uh, uh, it's quite similar, apart from the floating leaves uh, that peltatus should have uh, most of the time, the characters that separate from some of the short leaf forms of pseudofluotans uh, can be very difficult. Um, uh, and uh, in Britain, this is by far the more, most common subspecies uh, and penicillatus subspecies penicillatus is much rarer. Um, so Ranchus peltatus uh, is a short-leaved one, it's essentially part, one of the pond groups, but will occur in, in rivers. Um, it, it also has floating leaves, um, and uh, if you have the floating leaves, that is uh, a help from separating it from, from pseudofluotans. Um, very often, uh, the floating leaves of Paltasis often have quite a wide uh, gap at the base. Uh, so you've got the stalk coming here, uh, and there's quite a wide gap between the basal lobes. Uh, if we go to a Cratylus, uh, very often the, the, there's quite a, a narrow gap and uh, uh, almost overlapping sometimes. Um, and often the, the uh, the actual lobes are a bit more pointed, but these are characters that are very variable and, and not uh, are not very useful. Um, but they can sometimes sort of help in your decision making as to which one fits best. Uh, but the, the main one of the main features of uh, Aquatilis is that the pe petals are much smaller than both Penicillatus and uh, Peltatus. So. These petals sh uh, should be in the range of six to ten millimeters, as opposed to Peltatus uh, and Penicillatus. The, the petals are usually greater than ten millimeters, uh, even up to sort of fifteen millimeters. So I was just going to finish uh, with a, a case study just to work through uh, some of the characters that we've been discussing. Uh, this uh, 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 is a, 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 a specimen, I think, from, from uh, Scotland, um, uh, and have pictures of, of the different features. Uh, so just to, to run through. First of all, it was flowering, um, uh, and it's a, an aquatic form. So we know that it, it, should, it should be identifiable. Um, Remembering going back to the saying, if it's not flowering, if it's terrestrialized, just ranunculus spur. Don't try and go any further. Uh, so we've got laminar leaves are present, uh, and it's also got capillary leaves. Um, so that again cuts down the field quite considerably. Oh, and uh, also the uh, capillary leaves are, are shorter than the internodes. You've got sort of a gap here between between the leaves. Uh, and that takes us to uh, this part of the key. So it's got floating leaves and capillary leaves, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's a short leaf one. So we're, we've got a choice of three, and we've immediately cut down the possibilities. Um, uh, it, we've got fruits on it, and you can see, uh, you'll see these hairs even in quite young flowers. If you sort of take off the petals and stamens, you can see even then that the, these bristles will be present. So we know it's got hairs on the fruits, it can't be by dotting uh, So we're left with uh, the two possibilities that are Cratylus and Peltatus, um, and the characters that can separate those um, are <coughs> the length of the fruiting peduncle compared to the, the petiole, uh, the flower size, the nectar pit. Uh, if we had intermediate leaves, that would help too, but we don't in this case. But these other characters, uh, 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 leaf length and uh, rigidity, uh, are not going to be useful in, in this comparison. So <clears throat> the petals are quite small, they're about seven millimeters long, so this is pointing to a cratylus. Uh, we've got nectar pits, and these are circular. So again, this is pointing to a cratylus. Uh, 
Um, now, if we, we have here, we've got a fruiting petiole, uh, sorry, a, a fruiting peduncle uh, going around here. And come, also coming from this node, we've got the lamina leaf. And in this case, the lamina leaf for the PTL is a bit shorter. And so that, uh, it's not strongly so, but uh, they're the sort of quite close in length. Uh, but that would point in, more in the direction of peltatus. <coughs> Uh, so very much in this group of more complicated ones, you're just having to make a judgment uh, on, on the sort of sum of the characters and, uh, and what fits best. Uh, so in this case, the uh, conclusion was that it was an actual quatalis based on the flower size and the, and the, and the circular nectar pit. Uh, and that character uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the, the length of the the PTL was a negative, but even so, the the the, the balance of, of characters is in favour of a quatalis. So I just wanted to finish by uh, saying uh, thank you to uh, BSBI for uh, organising this this webinar, uh, and particularly to the National Parks and Wildlife Service uh, who have provided funding support uh, uh, for this. And particularly to Claudia ferguson Smythe and, uh, uh, and Richard uh, and Nigel Holmes, who provided, provided a lot of the photographs here, uh, and Richard Lansdowne, too, for helping in the preparation of, uh, of this presentation. So uh, I, I will leave you there. Uh, I hope you're not too uh, daunted by some of the complications, but, uh, but do bear in mind that there are quite a few that are quite easy to separate off. Thank you, Nick, that was fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in, so we'll, we'll go around to those now. If anyone has any other questions, please do pop them in the Q&A. Um, I think the, the most kind of specific one to start with, uh, Fowl had a question, she said, celery leaf buttercup, what sort of pH does the plant need? Is that something you could answer? Uh, it's very much at the richer end of things. It's a, it's a uh, a eutrophic muddy species that can take lots of nutrients and uh, so uh, it, it's very much a lowland um, ditches and um, cattle trampled areas and, uh, and, and the like. Uh, you'll never get it in, in the softer waters or sort of mesotrophic. It's definitely a eutrophic species. Thank you. Um, and she's also asked, uh, what are the factors that influence the growth of ranunculus? So uh, why would you find some plants in some rivers, but perhaps not elsewhere? Perhaps the um, question leads into that. <laughs> well, it, uh, yeah, I, I, there's quite, uh, I mean, uh, along with quite a lot of aquatic plants, they are adapted to uh, a, a range of uh, water level fluctuations and uh, particularly in rivers, uh, quite a lot of flow, uh, and even the pond species in rivers tend to be more floppy leaves and, and more uh, 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 sort of uh, parallel sided than, than they do when they're in nice static conditions. Um, uh, but uh, this is part of the complication is that they, uh, particularly with water levels are, are going up and down, uh, it can make quite a difference. And, and you do have to be careful sometimes, I was sort of saying about terrestrialized material, if you've got the water levels have dropped um, and then they come up again, you will still find those rather short leaves, terrestrialized form uh, leaves, but they'll be underwater. So you have to be a little bit careful, of it, particularly in shallow water. Um, yeah. Uh, but in terms of producing floating leaves, um, uh, that again is, is related to uh, how calm the conditions are. Uh, it could be because, of course, if you're in a river and you've got a floating lamina leaf, that's quite easy to strip off. Um, whereas in ponds, you will often find much more in the way of floating leaves than you would in, uh, uh, in the flow. Fantastic. And Neve says, um, what time of year are the lamina leaves usually produced? Uh, and what is the best time of year to try and identify plants to species, i.e. where the greatest number of characteristic features are present? 
I would say now is a good time. Uh, I, I would say uh, they're often getting to the surface and um, beginning to flower uh, in June, but sometimes in June, uh, le ones that uh, do produce floating leaves normally, uh, they, they sort of flower first and then follow up later with the floating leaves. Um, so sometimes you have to be a bit careful in June, but by the time July, usually um, it, it's uh, a good time. Um, uh, and thereafter, it often depends on, um, uh, particularly in rivers, uh, what the flows regime has been. So, uh, because it, if, if it's been a lot of water going down, they will put effort into, into um, uh, into vegetated spread, um, but so you, it may be that things are quieter in September, and you'll uh, uh, and it put, put effort into flowering, and you'll find flowering in in September. But on the whole, it tends to be uh, best to be looking around about now and into August. So perhaps depending on whether you've got a uh, you're looking at a particular situation where you know the the river you're going to go to, you could you could vary your visits based on whether it's been drier or um, wetter based on the kind of characteristics you know you're going to be looking for. Absolutely, no, yeah. no, it's it's, it's uh, I've uh, 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 there are a number of occasions when I say I've wanted some material from a course and that finding stuff uh, after it's been after it's been rainy can be quite difficult yeah. uh, uh, whereas other times it's just uh, no problem at all uh, one thing i have noticed and i don't know if it's a uh, uh, particular to the species is, is that i think that ranculus trichophilus trichophilus tends to be quite early um there's some not very far from me here uh, and i um uh, i've noticed it, it, on several years that I've seen it flowering uh, in June quite happily, um, but a little bit later uh, it's more or less disintegrated. So that might be one that you have to catch a little bit early. Thank you. And I think we've just got one last question, which is a very practically minded one, which I quite like. Um, and it's from an anonymous uh, uh, attendee, but they've said, any advice on ways to clean Wellingtons, etc., so to prevent spreading invasive species when wading, looking at plants? Right, yes, now this is quite an important thing, particularly sort of uh, uh, when you're going from site to site uh, and uh, people that are doing surveys, they often have uh, uh, um, chemicals that they, uh, the, the, uh, the most commonly used one is, is Vircon um, uh, and uh, they will spray the, down the wellies with, with Vircon and, and try and get rid of any mud from the cracks in the, uh, uh, in the soles um, and just sort of clean them off before they go to a new site. Um, the alternative is just to dry them. If you, if you dry your boots overnight before you go to the next site, uh, that kills off, I think, most of the bugs um, uh, that, that, that might be transferred. But it is an issue of quite considerable concern um, things like crayfish plague uh, is, is being carried around. Uh, um, I, I, I know that it, it's been seen a number of times in uh, uh, in Southeast Ireland, for example, uh, and and of course uh, uh, in Britain too. Um, and uh, it, it, that's quite a serious threat to the native white clawed crayfish. Uh, so it is an important, the sort of bio, biosecurity is really quite important. And uh, uh, the main things are uh, make sure your boots are clean, uh, not just for, for the sort of things like um, uh, uh, crayfish plague, but uh, fragments of introduced plants are, can also be transferred uh, in the uh, soles uh, in your boots. Uh, if you can, uh, dry off your equipment before you, you visit a new site. If not, then the best thing is to spray it down with a chemical such as Vircon. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think that all that remains to be said is thank you so much, Nick, for, for all of that. That was fantastic.